Obviously, we're going to continue through Galatians, but we're going to do something different this week. As I was planning last night to preach on faithfulness, it dawned upon me that there was something I needed to do at the beginning of the series that I had failed to do. It's something that I now see the necessity for, and that being a proper understanding of the whole book of Galatians. Exactly what is the Apostle Paul getting at in Galatians? Last week we looked at Romans 1 through 4, and I found it to be very beneficial to walk through Romans 1 through 4. I never preached a sermon quite like that before, where I took such a huge portion of scripture just to walk through and explain Paul's argumentation. But it was highly beneficial for me to grow in my understanding of how the Apostle, by the Holy Spirit, explains the gospel. And in the book of Galatians, it is laid out very similar, Paul's argument to what is laid out in Romans. In fact, I would really like to do that today, is do a walkthrough of Galatians. We're not going to look at faithfulness. We'll look at that next week. So we'll have faithfulness, um, and then gentleness, and self-control. So three more fruits, and then one more week, and we'll finish, uh, we'll, we'll probably add that last phrase of verse 24 to self-control. So we'll have, next week, we'll have faithfulness, gentleness, and then self-control. And we will be done with our series in Galatians. And I've already been thinking about what's going to be next. What do I want to do next? And I want to do verse-by-verse -verse exposition. Now, I'll just share with you <coughs> quickly. I am committed to expository preaching. Expository preaching simply means that you explain the text. See, my job is these three simple things when I'm in the pulpit. First and foremost, I am to tell you what Scripture says. The second thing is I'm to tell you what Scripture means by what it says. And then thirdly, I'm to tell you what that implies for you. What are the implications of that reality upon your life? How does that come down upon you and how does that bear on your life? These are my three duties as a preacher of the gospel. I'm not here to entertain. I'm not here to bring you laughter. I'm not here to even comfort you. I'm here to bring to you the Word of God. And the Word of God will comfort you. And if, and if, at least for me, many times it brings entertainment even, because I enjoy listening to sermons. But it's much more than just an entertainment. In fact, that's probably a poor way of describing it. It's, it's a, it is a powerful God-ordained means of growth and holiness. The preaching of the Word of God is the means by which the church stands or falls. In fact, this church will stand or it will fall upon the preaching of the Word of God. And there's only one way to preach the Word of God. It's to explain what it means. When we look throughout the New Testament and even in the Old, that's exactly what the prophets did. That's exactly what Jesus and the apostles did. Especially when we, when we survey the New Testament. When we see where Jesus, and especially in the book of Acts, where Peter and others quoted Old Testament passages, they would quote them and then explain its meaning. And then they would give the implication of that reality to their hearers. And God mightily blessed their ministries for that. It breaks my heart to say that so many churches, uh, and so, even in the Southern Baptist Convention, even in a, a conservative denomination, even in this county, I'm sure, lack expository preaching. That is, the preacher does so many things, but what he does so little of is simply, what does the text say, what does it mean, and how does that bear down on my life? So many preachers do not do this thing. They would rather get into the pulpit and begin to tell a bunch of jokes, a bunch of stories, oftentimes making themselves the heroes of those stories. Perhaps we've all experienced this one time or another in our lives, hearing a very poor sermon because it failed to do the one thing that a preacher is supposed to do, bring the word. In fact, the Apostle Paul charged Timothy. He said, what? What did he say? Preach the word. And so that is exactly what I am here to do, week in and week out, is preach the Word. Even in our Sunday school, it's the same thing I'm doing here. I'm explaining to you the Word. You come here to get the Word. You come here to get fed. And I'm here to bring you the meat. I'm here to bring to you the pure milk of the Word of God as Scripture describes it. And for nothing else. That's the only thing that a preacher is to be doing. And when they do that, God will bless that. God will convert souls. God will uh, encourage His people. And God will be glorified through the preaching of His Word. In fact, a famous preacher 
once remarked that the preacher, that is the pastor, has nothing else to say apart from what the Word of God has to say. Even this morning as we were discussing in Sunday school, heaven and what is heaven like? And we were discovering, or we were discussing what exactly will happen in heaven, and I just continually remarked repeatedly, I really don't know that much. In terms of what are the activities of heaven, I know we're going to be worshiping God, I know we're going to be fellowshiping with Him, but how that really plays out, I'm not sure. I don't have anything to tell you apart from what the Word of God has to say. The rest would be speculation, tradition, or my own opinion. It would not be factual. It would not be scriptural. That's not to say it's not true. That's not saying that, well, if it's not reading God's Word, it's just not true. Well, that's not true. That's a, that kind of statement not, is not true. But nonetheless, the only life-changing realities and truths that a person can find are found within the Word of God. I cannot stress this enough for this church, especially in the midst of the Bible Belt, in the midst of the Southern Baptist Convention, the Lawrence Baptist Convention, or association, I should say. We must stand upon the preaching of the Word of God. It's everything to the local church. In fact, I, I had told Joe that I wanted to screw this pulpit to the floor of this stage. I wanted to nail this thing down because this church will stand or fall upon the preaching of the Word of God. It's all about the Word. I mean, what other reason do Christians gather together for? What other reason? We're here to hear the Word. What does the Bible say? So the mightiest men whom God has, has ever used, and we were discussing some of those men after Sunday school, John Calvin, Martin Luther, and the Reformers, and even after them, men like that we see today, R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, Paul Washer, and other men who faithfully preach God's Word. How do they do that? They explain what it says. It's very simple. It's very simple. In fact, the concept is simple, but in, practice, in, in playing that out in your preaching, it is difficult. Because you must be faithful to the text. You must give attention to its context. And that is why I want to do a survey of Galatians. I want to give us a bird's eye view of the book. And where, where is Paul coming from? Where is he taking it? So, especially as we finish those last three fruits out, as we finish those last three Christian virtues, we will fully understand the greater context of Paul's argument. We will understand where is this jewel of Scripture set in the necklace of the book? Where is it set? And, and how does that fit in? And so we'll begin in chapter 1. We'll walk through that chapter, chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we will close in chapter 6, verse 18. It is my prayer, my heart's desire, that you be edified and strengthened and grown in grace. We must understand where the apostles coming from. God wrote these books, or God inspired, I should say, men to write these books in a linear manner. That is, that in a one line. They're going somewhere. They're starting somewhere. They're going to explain something. They're going somewhere. Oftentimes, what preachers will do, and even I myself find my uh, my own self doing this from time to time is we'll take a verse or we'll take a set of verses out of a, a, a section of scripture and we will want to preach that, but we oftentimes forget to give attention to its context. In fact, error after error in the church today, heresies that arise are oftentimes found because of this one simple error. They don't pay attention to the context. One such passage that oftentimes is misapplied and misused is a very famous passage, Jeremiah 29, 11. Many Christians will quote it now, where God tells the Israelites, He says, For I know that I have the plans for or, for I know that I uh, for I know I have the plans for you. Plans for prosperity and not for harm, and etc. etc. But they forget the greater context. Who is God speaking to? Well, as I said a moment ago, he's speaking to the Israelites in that section of scripture. And he is promising to bring them back into the land. So we have to understand the greater context. God had promised to Abraham and his descendants what? Land. 
He promised to make them a great nation. But what happened? They sinned against God. They turned from His commandments. So God, what did He do? He punished them. He sent them into exile. And so God speaks to them while they're in exile. The 70 years they're in Babylon, God raises up the prophet Jeremiah and says through him, you, or he says, for I know I have these plans for you and I'm going to prosper you. And he's speaking about bringing them back to the land. Why? Because God is faithful to his promises. See, that text doesn't show us that God is going to prosper every Christian or God's going to make us wealthy or healthy or whatever. It shows us that God is faithful to His promises. See, when we consider the grander context of a selected portion of Scripture, it takes on a whole new meaning. The face of the text changes right before us, and we are therefore transformed. See, how much more glorious is the meaning of, well, when God says He knows He has, he has the plans for us and He wants to prosper us as His people, not necessarily meaning that we have wealth or health or even a happy life, but that we receive God's promises fulfilled upon us. That is a much greater meaning. A much greater meaning indeed. There's many other texts I could make mention of. One, one such is Philippians 4.13, where the apostle says, For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Again, many Christians will quote this in basically any context. They'll say, well, I'm starting this, this new business. Philippians 4.13. I want to be an athlete. Philippians 4.13. I want to be the president. Philippians 4.13. They'll just quote it and quote it and quote it. As if it is a verse that can be used to proclaim that God is going to bless you no matter what you do. That God's going to prosper you no matter what you do. They're probably quite shocked when they find out that, well, that job did not go as how they planned or they didn't become the president and their athlete career failed. They're going to be quite confused as to why that is because they saw in Philippians 4.13 that we can do all things through Christ. But is that what the text has spoken? Very far from the truth. What the Apostle Paul is explaining here in Philippians 4, if you read the greater context, is that he had gone through hard, hard times. There were times when he was poor. There were times when he had an abundance. There were times, as we know from, uh, from 2 Corinthians 11, that the Apostle Paul experienced shipwreck, and he experienced abandonment, and he was beat and whipped, and he was betrayed. He lived a very hard life. And so he comes to Philippians 4, and he writes to the Philippians, there have been times when I have lacked very many things. and many times where I have had an abundance. He says, but, in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The context changes the meaning, or it defines, I should say, the meaning to what it ought to be. The Apostle Paul's not saying, if you simply claim this verse upon your life, you can do whatever you want. That's ridiculous. That's paganism. That's what that is. That's a belief taken from paganism. Oftentimes I criticize the prosperity gospel movement. And the reason I do so is because it's paganism. It's demonic. This kind of create your own reality. Name it and claim it. Theology. In fact, I remember one time going on Facebook to a particular pastor's page and I went on there and he had wrote on a couple of his statuses. He, he said something to the effect of, I claim Psalm, I forgot exactly what Psalm it was, this morning. And I thought, what? Claiming? No one ever claimed anything in the Bible. What are you talking about? This idea of claiming a scripture or claiming something over someone. This proclaiming, you're your, your speaking into existence and a better reality. This is what's pro propagated by men like Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, other ones like them. You have positive thoughts, positive speech, all this kind of stuff. You're creating your own reality. That's paganism. In fact, it's quite borderline blasphemous. Who can create things by speaking them? Is it man? No. Who is the one person who can? It's God. The one being who can speak and things are created is God. How dare we think that we as human beings, we're dust. How dare we think that we can speak something or say something and it somehow changes reality. That negates the sovereignty of God. It strips God of His supremacy. And it exalts us way too high. But the text of Scripture, going back to Philippians 4, in its context, Paul's saying, no matter how hard life gets or even how easy it seems, I can do all things through Christ. 
I can endure. I can stand firm. I can walk in holiness. I can walk in purity. I can obey God because Christ strengthens me. That is the meaning. So when we are going through hard times in our lives with marital conflict or financial strains or, or issues with children, unconverted children, whatever it may be, we can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So when we look at these fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, and we see the Apostle Paul list these out, I want us to understand the greater context of what Paul is saying. So with that said, that was just a couple of introductory notes. I want to pray really quickly. I wanted to do that at the beginning, but I got into my introduction. I was very excited. So let's pray. Ask the Lord to align our minds as we look at this book, as we survey it for His glory. Father, I pray that you would bless this time as we look at your word, as we look at this book of Galatians. I pray you would enlighten our hearts and our minds to understand the text in its proper context, in its historical, grammatical context. Understand what the apostle is saying. Understand his unfolding of his argumentation so that we may be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, that we may greater understand what Christ has done for us. Father, I ask if anyone is here in this room is yet to be converted, that you would work on their hearts and minds to save them for your glory. Father, we praise you and we glorify you for what you've done for us in Christ, as we're going to see, especially in chapter 3 of this book, how you sent Christ to put away our sin. That he came his first time to put away sin and he is coming again soon. No longer to put away sin, but to put away sinners, to administer judgment and to receive your holy ones into glory. And so we anxiously await his blessed return. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. <coughs> Amen. So the title of this sermon will be The Letter of Paul to the Galatians. The Letter of Paul to the Galatians. Or you could perhaps call it a survey of Galatians. Or a walkthrough of Galatians. There's a, probably an endless amount of titles you could give this message. So just to note on the context before we even begin at verse 1 of chapter 1. Where was this book written to? In other words, where is this located? Well, Galatia was a, a specific location within the Roman Empire. This, was in, this book was written obviously within the first century by the Apostle Paul to the churches of Galatia. It wasn't just a single church, unlike the Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, was written to a one singular church. Galatians was written to a group, a cluster of churches within a particular area. You could see it like, if you wanted to apply it to our modern day, someone wrote a, a letter to the churches of Lawrence County. It would be this particular area someone sends a letter to, or if you want to expand that even further, someone wrote a letter to the churches of South Carolina. It's very similar because Galatia was a province in the Roman Empire. It was a province. It was like a state in their nation. So Paul writes this generic letter to these churches in Galatia. What is the main point of the Apostle Paul's book to the, uh, to the Galatians? It is simply this. Salvation is not by works. It is not by circumcision. It is by faith alone. And actually, we just looked at that this morning in our Sunday school, so we're going to kind of go over some of the things we've already looked at, but also some new stuff. Because the Apostle Paul tackles this argument and tackles this reality from a different angle than he does in Romans. In the book of Romans, it's in a very generic sense. He just talks about not working for your salvation, not living under the law. But in Galatians, he's specifically addressing the issue of circumcision. See, in the early church, we had the Gentile Christians and then we had the Jewish Christians. And there was a lot of divide between the two. Oftentimes, the Jewish Christians would cause a lot of trouble for the Gentile Christians. Because some of the Jews were confused as to exactly what the role of God's law was in the life of the Christian. Such heresies arose in the early church, such as uh, the heresy of antinomianism. Antinomianism. Very interesting word we need to understand what it means. Antinomianism is two words put together. Nomianism. And nomian is derived from the Greek word nomos, which is law. And then anti, of course, is against. So the antinomians were against the law. In other words, they said... You're a Christian now. 
You do what you want. Don't worry about rules. Don't worry about obeying God. Don't worry about holiness. None of that matters. Christ paid it all. You're free. You do what you want. So they were characterized by licentiousness, sin, immorality. They were characterized by blatant sin and immorality. And then on the way on the other end of the spectrum, we had the legalists. Or as many Christians have dubbed them, the Judaizers. In other words, they were those who said, no, 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 now you're a Christian, or to be a true Christian, to be really saved, you, you, not only do you have to believe in Jesus and trust in Him, but you need to get circumcised. And you need to try to keep the law to be justified. Both heresies are damning. Both heresies are very dangerous to the church. And really throughout the ages, as we look down the corridor of time and we walk through the halls of church history, we will see upon those walls scars of either one of these heresies. We will see the scar of antinomianism in many different denominational backgrounds and traditions. We'll also see the scar of legalism permeating throughout those walls of church history. In fact, as we spoke on this morning, or looked at this morning, I should say, in our Sunday school, that was precisely what we were discussing afterward, and even during that time, about the Roman Catholic Church. They were steeped in legalism. They believed you must keep the law. Legalism is derived, again, from the word legal, which is a legal term, technically, obviously. And it references the law. You're trying to keep the law. You're a legalist. You're defined by your law-keeping. And your law-keeping defines your standing for God. So the Apostle Paul writes confronting the error of legalism to the Galatians. The Judaizers who would claim to be Christians, but they were not, they would come to the churches in Galatia, and they would begin to tell the Christians, you know what, that's great, you believe in Jesus, it's great that you have the Holy Spirit, but you need to also get circumcised. You Gentiles need to get circumcised. And then also, uh, you need to keep the law, so we need to go ahead and start doing the Mosaic rituals, dietary laws, etc., etc., but the, 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 you could say, right out of the gate, what they wanted people to do was get circumcised. Circumcision is so key to our understanding of this book. The Jews believed that circumcision was one of the chiefest, most important things you could do. It was the sign of the Old Covenant. When God set apart Abraham, called him out of the land of Ur, called him unto himself, and set him apart as the first Jews, the first uh, man of this Jewish nation... God commands him to get circumcised, set himself apart, so he would be set apart from the peoples, and be holy unto the Lord. It was a sign of his holiness. It was a sign of his being made right with God. It wasn't to be saved. We know that Abraham got saved long before he was circumcised. He was saved what? by what? Believing sincerely the promises of God. He believed God. But God did command him to be circumcised as a sign and seal of that. And there's a parallel between that and baptism in the New Covenant. When we're saved, we're saved by faith alone. But later on, what we will do is oftentimes we try to get people to do it as soon as possible. That is to be baptized because the Lord commanded it. It's a sign and seal of an inward cleansing of the heart. We've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. But the Judaizers and the Jewish nation as a whole, see, not only did they, as not only did the genuine believers were circumcised, but also their children. It was everyone in the covenant community. It was everyone in the, in the land of nation, the nation of Israel. All the males must be circumcised. In fact, after Abraham was circumcised, God then commanded him for all of his household. That would have been all his slaves. His male workers also must be circumcised. It was a sign that not only was he being set apart by God, but also his family, the nation of Israel as a whole, ultimately to bring who? Christ. It was all working toward that end, to bring the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem sinners from their sin. But the Jewish people held their circumcision so highly. It is what set them apart from the, from the pagans, from the idol worshippers. It set them apart from the evildoers. It had set them apart as the holy people of the Lord. And what did that do? It began to make them proud and self-righteous. Self-confident in their own right standing before God simply by birth. How many do we see in churches, oftentimes even to this day, we see that same thing play out? Christian parents 
will raise children in a godly environment, but their children will begin to presume upon their being born to Christian parents. As somehow making them right before God, as somehow making them more holy, as somehow justifying them, how foolish it is to think such a thing. Righteousness does not come through the flesh, but through faith in Christ. Righteousness is not inherited. It's received by faith alone. It's not something that you get by birth, but it's something God gives you by faith. It would be easier to, to cram a camel through the eye of a needle than to believe that you can have righteousness, can have right standing before God simply because you were born to someone. Simply because you are born to holy parents, a preacher's child, etc., etc. The Apostle Paul confronts this error because it was prideful, it was arrogant, and it rejected the gospel is what it was. It's a rejection of the gospel. In other words, if Christ, if His work isn't sufficient, then the gospel is useless and it's vain. If we could do anything to make ourselves right with God, if we could be circumcised and therefore be made right with God by that action, then Christ died needlessly. Christ's death was worthless. But we know from Scripture that we can do nothing. Do nothing in salvation. Even faith, even the act of placing one's faith in Christ, even that is not a work. And here's why. Because faith itself is not something we muster up. It's not something found within people. Oftentimes preachers will say, oh, just open your heart to Jesus or receive Him. I'm not condemning them for making an evangelistic call. We ought to. But oftentimes what they, what they fail to recognize is the fact that the sinner can't do that. The sinner can't do that. The sinner can't trust in Christ. They can't repent. They can't believe. You can't. In fact, uh, Jesus said this very thing in John 3 when Nicodemus asked him after Jesus had said, you must be born again. He said, well, I have to enter my mother's womb again. Nicodemus was saying, okay, well, how do I do it? And then he says, the wind blows wherever it wishes. So is the Spirit of God. What? What kind of answer is that? He's saying, you can't. It's the Spirit who does it. He's going to do what He wants. That's the sovereignty of God right there. That's the sovereignty of God in the salvation of a sinner. No one will be saved apart from the grace of God in their lives. God is sovereign. In fact, the Bible says in, in Romans 9, it says, so that it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God and His mercy. It's not about what you do, because you can't do anything. It's only God who works. God grants faith. God grants repentance. That's why the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.25 that God grants sinners repentance. Why is salvation totally 100% of God? So that all the glory goes 100% to God. And that's what the Apostle Paul is wanting to establish here in this book. You can't do it. Circumcision won't be good enough. Nothing will be good enough but faith in Christ alone. So with that lengthy introduction and some contextual notes, I now want us to begin in verse 1. And we're going to walk through chapter 1, chapter 2, and hopefully finishing chapter 6. Time will quickly flee from us if I go too detailed, so I'll try to keep it brief at each stopping point. The Apostle Paul opens the book in verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, to all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. You know what's so profound about that first phrase where he, in my Bible, has it in parentheses? Is he says, I'm not sent from men. In other words, my teaching doesn't come from men like the Judaizers. It's from God. I am an apostle sent by God. In verse 3, he says his very popular phrase that he uses in almost every single one of his epistles. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this gospel summarization in verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. So that is a quick a gospel summary. And then in verse, verse 6, he just gets right into it. Paul does not spend much time with an introduction. He goes straight into it in verse 6. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. And now he is writing here to Christians. Christian churches. And he says, I am astounded. I am blown away by the fact that you have abandoned Christ. That's incredible. You know why that's so profound? is because he says, if you trust in your work, 
If you're a Christian and you're relying upon your performance and your ability to make yourself right with God, you are abandoning, you are forsaking God. You are fleeing from God. If you're trusting in Christ alone and you're resting in His Word, you are staying with God. You're abiding in God. As the Lord Jesus Himself said in John 15, Abide in Me, for you will bear much fruit. When you are not abiding in Christ, you are fleeing from Christ. Verse 7, listen to what he says. It is really not another. In other words, the gospel that I just said is a different gospel. It's really not another gospel. He says, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So he's saying it's really not a different gospel because they're, they're talking a lot about Christ and the message of his death and resurrection. But he says they're distorting it. They're twisting it at the end. There's a lot of truth there, but there's error in it. In fact, the most dangerous error is that which is cloaked in truth. The most dangerous error is that which has layer upon layer upon layer of truth surrounding it. That is why men who claim to be preachers of God's word, but are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, are the most dangerous and to be greatly feared. We are to flee false teachers. We are to flee from listening to false teachers. They may say so much truth. That's one of the criticisms I'll get from people all the time. When I criticize a false teacher or I call out someone who's not preaching the truth of God's word, they'll say, well, they say this, this, and this, and this, and this. And I say, that's good they say that. I said, but this does not negate the reality of their saying this wrong, whatever error I might be confronting. Brethren, we must stand upon the truth. If someone is preaching a lot of truth, but still error, they're in error. The truth doesn't outweigh the error. The good doesn't outweigh the bad. We must confront the error. And that's what the Apostle Paul says here. He says their error distorts the gospel. It twists it. But listen to this. Listen to verse 8 and 9. This is so profound. Verse 8, he says, But if, even if we, in other words, the apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is anathema. That's the Greek word there used. He is accursed. He is damned. That's, the, that's a strong word he uses in Greek there. And accursed is, is really a lighter translation. It is damned. You're damned by God. You have God's judgment upon you when you preach a false gospel. And he says even if an angel from heaven, in other words, one of God's servants in heaven, should preach to you a gospel that is contrary to the gospel we preach, they're damned. They're an athlete. That's astounding. Verse 9, listen, he says the exact same thing again. As we've said before, so I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. We must get the gospel right, brethren. And that's why the Apostle Paul sets the stage here in chapter 1 for this. He shows us what's at stake. It's eternal salvation is at stake. It's your soul that's at stake. You must understand the gospel correctly. Your soul is at stake. The souls of those who are under my care as a pastor is at, are at stake. The souls of our family members and friends are at stake. They must have a proper understanding of the gospel or they will be anathema. They will be damned. It's important that we as Christians have a proper understanding of the gospel. For if we do not have a proper and a correct view of the gospel, when we share what we believe concerning the gospel to others, if it's not the biblical gospel, it won't save. It won't help people. I remember when I was in Houston, Texas in February, I was at the Super Bowl Outreach with Sports Fan Outreach International. It's a wonderful ministry. They employ three preachers to go out and share the gospel. And what I mean by employ, I should say deploy, not actually employ. But they deploy street, uh, street preachers in, usually in these conferences like this. So we all met together for a weekend in February. We had teaching. We had times of prayer together. We all stayed at the Christian camp with one another. And it was absolutely wonderful. One of the most uh, wonderful times I've ever had in my entire life with other believers. Amazing. Just a, a hundred men who stood for the truth and who were, who were fervent for the Word of God, fervent to preach the gospel. It was a blessing. But as I was there on the last day, a dear brother of mine, Aaron, uh, we were preaching down at the NRG Stadium in Houston, where the Super Bowl was at. It was on Super Bowl Sunday, in fact. We were preaching down there, and we, he and I decided to go away from our main group, and we decided to go out to our own spot on the street and begin preaching, take turns. As my dear brother began to preach the gospel with very much passion and fervency, I noticed that across the street and down a little ways, there was a group of 
people also were street preaching. There was a man up on a box and a bunch of people around him. A couple guys with guitars playing. People praying for other people. It was probably a good group of 15 of them. They were dressed like normal people. Not really dressed up any differently. They were actually most of the millennials. My age. I was quite astounded. I had never seen such a sight before. Usually the street preacher is quite older. There's very few young street preachers. In fact, I only know of one that's younger than me. And that's my dear brother Matthew Little. Out in California. 16 year old street preacher. Quite astounding. But nonetheless, they were preaching, and I went down there to begin to confront them, and I wasn't even looking at them in a um, disparaging or disrespectful manner. I wasn't trying to, to do anything to start trouble. I actually just wanted to simply speak with them. I didn't even know who they were or what they believed. So I approached the, a couple of the guys who were actually playing guitars, and um, I just began to ask them, I said, where are you guys from? And they began to share that they're from a church there in Houston. And, they shared with me that they were charismatics. They were Pentecostal, I think, if I remember correctly. And I simply asked them, I said, well, here, I'll challenge you with this. What is the gospel? I said, what is the gospel message? They said, you guys are out here preaching. You're out here praying with people. You're out here playing your guitars. You're doing evangelism, right? So what is the gospel? What is the gospel message of eternal life? To my dismay, I pressed and pressed, and they could not give me an answer. Could not give me a definite answer as to according to what the gospel is. It, even though all I had to do was simply flip their Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15 and read what the Apostle Paul said. He said that the gospel is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But no, they would not listen. And so our conversation ended quite abruptly where I was quite bold with them and called them out. I said, what are you guys preaching out here if you don't even know what you're preaching? I began to quickly realize that we really weren't really preaching anything. They were just praying for people, literally. They would just stop people in the street and ask them to pray for them. And supposedly, as they claimed, people were getting healed. Yes, that's right. They believed that people were getting healed on the spot on the streets. In fact, my brother Aaron and I witnessed a, and this breaks my heart to say, but a man who was disabled and had a cane walking down the street. And they confronted this man, a bunch of them jumped around him, quickly talked with him for a moment, and began to pray over him uncomfortably began to speak in tongues as they claimed. Everyone began to speak in some jibber-jabber that made no sense whatsoever. And it, it was really bizarre. And they prayed for a quite, at least it felt like an eternity. Maybe it's because I was so uncomfortable. But nonetheless, this man walked off not using his cane. He wasn't using it. He was limping a little bit, but nonetheless, he wasn't using his cane. He walked off. My brother Aaron and I decided to follow this man down the street, just from a distance, to see what would happen. And as soon as he got out of eye shot, he pulled his cane back out and continued to walk. Been tricked, been duped. That doesn't sound like an apostolic healing to me. Doesn't sound like a biblical healing to me. So we approached him again, we went back down, and we confronted him again. What's the gospel? Why did you pray for this man and he's not healed and then claim that he was healed? Why are you out here doing false wonders and signs? Why are you, what are you preaching? What's your about? What are you about? They, again, could not, even the leaders could not tell me what the gospel was. In fact, they couldn't even answer our challenges concerning the man that was crippled. It broke my heart truly to see, to see that happen. And bizarrely, uh, I, should, I don't even know if that's a word, very, in a bizarre manner, they then tried to lay hands on myself and my brother Aaron and, and pray over us in their bizarre tongues. It was very weird. In fact, I was filming this, and you can actually see the whole encounter on my YouTube channel. The video's on there. And they actually tried to put their hands on us, and I became very uncomfortable, and I started backing up. And We even started saying out loud, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, because it was probably borderline demonic. So they're not out there preaching no gospel, doing no true healing. What are they about? There's no power in it. There's no life change in it. And so we quickly condemned them. And we quickly called them out and rebuked them. <coughs> we had to. And so we went down the street. We went back to our spot. We continued to preach the gospel. And warn people, stay away from these folks. So not every street preacher is a good street preacher. Not every person on the street preaching is preaching the gospel. 
That's just an illustration of someone who would even, in passing, maybe talk about Christ, but not preach the gospel. They, as the Judaizers did here, they distort the gospel of Christ. They distort it and twist it unto their own destruction. Consequently, my brother Aaron informed me, I think a couple of weeks later, that that church had actually closed down, that they were from. That's probably for the better. Verse 10, as we go back to the text in chapter 1, Paul says, for, I, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. I would not be a slave of Christ. In other words, he's saying, am I trying to please these Judaizers? Am I like them trying to please men? No. He says, if I was trying to please men, I wouldn't be serving Christ. In other words, if I was trying to please men, I would preach that you had to be circumcised. I would preach you had to keep the law. Because then the Jews would like me. They wouldn't hurt me. They wouldn't beat me. They wouldn't persecute me. This is own people. He says, then they wouldn't do that. But he had to preach salvation by grace through faith. So that's a little bit of the beginning of this chapter. And then as, as we go to chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 11 down through 24, the Apostle Paul defends his ministry. He defends his apostolic ministry. See, what these false teachers would do, they did it in the church at uh, Corinth as well, they would disparage the character of Paul. In other words, they would just make him look like an idiot to the church members. And this is a classic move. If someone wants to change your mind about someone else, they, all they have to do is just do some character destruction. They just have to make them look bad, and you'll quickly lose trust in that person. And that's what they did with Paul. They just, they just bashed his ministry, talked about how he wasn't qualified. They did this a lot in the church of Corinth as well, and it broke Paul's heart. So Paul defends his ministry there at the end of chapter 1. Chapter 2, he shares an interesting story, and we'll pick up at verse 11. This is a story between Peter and Paul, where Paul rebukes Peter. Interestingly enough, Peter was really the spokesman of the apostles. He was the, the ringleader, you could say. In verse 11, it says, When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. Whoa. The leader of the apostles stood condemned? Well, what's he mean by that? Verse 12, For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloft, fearing the party of the circumcision. In other words... Peter comes to Antioch. Paul's there, and he had used he, his custom was he would sit down and eat with the Gentiles. But men from James, in other words, Jewish believers, came down to Antioch, or actually, if you look at a map today, be going up to Antioch. And it, he says that when those men came, Peter fell into the fear of man, and he held himself off. In other words, he didn't eat with the Gentiles. He was prideful and arrogant. And says he feared the party of the circumcision. Verse 12, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy. With the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Now verse 14, listen to the very key phrase here. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Notice the terms there he uses. Circumcision and gospel. They are almost against one another. The idea of earning your own righteousness before God is alien to the gospel message. That is precisely what Paul's saying here. He's using an illustration of this truth. He's going to illustrate this reality. Listen to what he says in verse 14. If you, being a Jew, he's saying this to, to Peter, or still what he uses his name, Cephas here, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. How is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? He's calling out his hypocrisy. Verse 15, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is, now listen to this, is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. That really captures his argument of this book. You could say in verse 16, is one of perhaps multiple thesis statements in this book. It's what this book is about. Verse 17, But while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners. Is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. Verse 20, 
I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. And then the last part of verse 21 says, If righteousness comes to the law, Christ died needlessly. So he's illustrated this truth. Now he's going to explain it in the abstract in verse, or excuse me, chapter 3. Listen to the words he uses in verse 1. You foolish Galatians. Verse 2, he answers to them this. I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing the faith? In other words, how were you saved? Was my faith or work? Verse 3, listen to this. Are you so foolish? Wow. That's a pastor's heart coming out to you. There's a time for a pastor to preach the gospel to be bold. Are you so foolish? Are you such a fool? He says, have you, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, what they were holding to is, okay, I'm saved now, but now, in order to maintain my salvation or, or become better with God, is I've got to keep the law. I've got to perfect myself. And Paul says, you're trying to do it with flesh. And verse 4, listen to this. Did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed was it in vain? In other words, you lost so much for Christ. It could all be in vain because you may not be truly converted. That's how serious this is. That's how serious it is to trust in oneself. He says, if indeed it was in vain. In other words, if all that you've done for Christ is vain because you weren't ever converted in the first place. That's why he'll say later on in chapter 4, you've fallen from grace. Many interpreters interpret that to mean that there are people within the churches of Galatia that had actually never been converted Never been born again. And I would definitely agree with that sentiment. Verse 6, he quotes what he has used in Romans 4. Genesis 15, 6, Even so Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Verse 7, Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Verse 8, The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, this is so amazing, the nations will be blessed in you. So that those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. That's amazing. God preached the gospel to Abraham. The gospel was present in the Old Testament? Absolutely. The gospel of God saying, I'm going to bless the nations in you. And we know ultimately that's his seed, that's Christ. It's the coming Savior. The Old Testament saints were saved because they were looking. They were looking to the Savior. Verse 10, for it. Now listen to the bad news. For as many as the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Well, that's everybody. No one can keep the law. We've lied. We have blasphemed. We have committed adultery. We have idolized things. We've worshipped other gods. We have abandoned God. We have not been abiding in the things written in the book of the law. Therefore, we are cursed. The curse is upon us. Verse 11, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. He quotes, again, that's Habakkuk 2.4, just like he quotes in Romans. Verse 12, however, the law is not a faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. In other words, okay, you want to live by the law? Practice it, and you're going to find that you can't. Verse 13, listen to the good news of it. This is glorious. So even though we've broken the law and we are on the path to hell, we are going to be cursed, we're going to be anathema, we're going to be damned by God, we're, we're, out, we're outside of Christ, we're without hope, we're going to be eternally crushed. Verse 13, God then sends Christ, and it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, as is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. So Christ comes and he, he is nailed to the cross and he, he is slain under the wrath of Almighty God. God crushes him. He rises himself. He raises himself from the dead. Defeats the grave and he administers forgiveness to all who come to him. And that's why in verse 14 it says, In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Why? So that, listen to this, how, how will it come to the Gentiles? So that we would receive the promise of the Spirit. What does he say? By law? By circumcision? What's he say? <coughs> Through faith. And he brings that to a summarization. Christ 
has done it all. We believe that He's done it all. We believe that He satisfied God's wrath. God can forgive us. God can bring us into a peaceful standing with Him. As we saw this morning in Romans 5, 1, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through what He has done for us in Jesus. Because Christ satisfied. He placated God's wrath. And He wraps the believer in His righteousness. We're clothed in His righteousness. That's why in verse 21 of chapter, uh, chapter 2, He said, For if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died needlessly. Christ died so that we can have His righteousness. He takes our sin and we get His righteousness. What a glorious salvation this is. He continues in verse 15. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant. Yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say in seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed. That is Christ. The culmination of all the Old Testament is Christ. And then he explains more of, of the intent of the law. And I can summarize it by this. That the intent of the law also shows our sin. That we need a Savior. And that's Christ who fulfilled that very law. Verse 23. I'm sorry, excuse me. Verse 26 of chapter 3. Paul says, he summarizes again. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We're adopted. And then in verse 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. So he ends that chapter. And then in chapter 4, he talks about the fact that we have been adopted as God's children, as he, as he referenced there at the end of chapter 3. In fact, in verse 6, he says this in chapter, in chapter 4. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and a son and an heir through God. Praise the Lord for that. Verse 19, he uses a very enduring phrase. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and, change, and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. He expresses his heart. He wants these believers to grow in holiness. He wants them to have freedom in the Lord. And then in chapter, at the end of chapter 4, verses 21 through 31, he, he contrasts the bond and free. Those who are free in Christ and those who are still under the law. And he uses the analogy, or uses the illustration, I should say, of Hagar and Sarah. And we don't have time to look deeply into that. But that brings us into chapter 5. So now we've just seen how Paul defends his ministry in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, explains salvation by faith, illustrates that with the story between him and Peter. Chapter 3 is that the, the theological explanation of that, that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Chapter 4 is the fact that we are sons of God and we are free. We are no longer in bondage to the law. We are free in Christ. And then in chapter 5 and in chapter 6, he takes the abstract realities and he brings them to the practical. He says, okay, here's how you're going to live. Verse 1, chapter 5. It was for freedom. Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be again subject to a yoke of slavery. Now, this is the important part. We need to understand, especially chapter 1. What's the outline of chapter 1? I mean, excuse me, chapter 5. Chapter 5 has three parts to it. And I'll just quickly explain these in passing because we're about to close. First part. Circumcision is of no benefit. Second part. Love one another. Thirdly, walk in the Spirit. Those are the three parts of chapter 5. There, it's, it's perfectly divided into three sections. First section, verses 1 through 12, is he explains circumcision is of no value. It's of no value. Listen to what he says in verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And then why is that? Verse 3. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Listen to verse 4. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. There it is again. We receive the righteousness of Christ by faith. And verse 6. For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. So Paul in those first six verses tells us it's not, it doesn't mean anything in a Christian life. We have the righteousness of Christ. Circumcision or uncircumcision, it doesn't matter. It's about your heart. And then in verse 7, he scolds those 
Judaizers, those false teachers. Listen to the strong language. In verse 8, this persuasion, in other words, this teaching, did not come from him who called you. And in verse 11, but I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In other words, why am I being persecuted? Then the southern block of the cross has been removed. Now listen to verse 12. This is very strong language. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. You know what he's saying? We all know what circumcision is. Paul's saying, I want to go further. If they're going to preach a false gospel, go ahead and let them mutilate themselves. That's incredible. His burning zeal for the gospel brings him to say this about these false teachers. So that concludes that first half of chapter 5. Circumcision is of no benefit. And then the second half is this love one another. Verse 13, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. What he's saying is this. Okay, we don't live under the law. We're free in the Spirit. So what are we going to do with our freedom? What are we going to do with this freedom? Serve one another. That's what he says in verse 13. And then he quotes the Old Testament charge. Love your neighbors yourself. The commandment now that we are free in the Spirit is this. We are to love one another. See, here's the thing about the law. The law tells us what to do. But here's the thing about the Spirit. The Spirit inwardly leads us to do what we are to do. That's the thing. When someone becomes a Christian, you don't have to teach them to obey God. They just do it. Because the Spirit is in them. See, that's the difference between the Old and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant says, do this, do this, do this. It teaches them. It says, okay, you've got to keep the commandments. You know what the New Covenant is? God says, I will write my law upon their hearts. That's the promise He gave through Jeremiah and through Ezekiel. In the New Covenant, God will write the law upon the heart. That's the thing. We're not under the law, and here's why. Is it so we're just going to do whatever we want? No, it's because we don't need it. We have it written upon our hearts. We don't have to be told, love your neighbor. We don't have to be told to love God. We do it. Because the Spirit is in us. That's what Paul's getting at here in chapter 5. This is so imperative to understand this, brethren. Where are Paul's coming from? He's destroying these arguments. He's saying, circumcision doesn't matter. This idea of working out your own salvation by the law doesn't matter. But however, as a Christian, here's the thing. We now walk in fulfillment of the law. Why? Because we have the Spirit. We have the Spirit who wrote the law. We have the Spirit who inspired the law to be written. And we have the Spirit who has written it upon our hearts. That's the idea. That's why in verse, again, the whole theme of this chapter is to walk by the Spirit. In fact, even in my Bible, that's exactly what it says at the beginning, uh, above verse 1. It says, walk by the Spirit. Your, your Bible may, may say something a little, uh, a little similar or maybe a little different. But even the translators understood, okay, yeah, this chapter is talking about freedom of the Spirit. You're to walk in the freedom of the Holy Spirit. We are free from this, someone having to tell us what to do. Because the Spirit's in us. When I was saved, when the Lord saved me, I didn't need anyone to tell me I need to read my Bible or pray or serve or go to church or love other Christians or preach the gospel. I didn't need, I didn't need anybody to tell me that. I just did it. Why? Because the Spirit was in me, enabling me to do it, causing me to do it. That's the difference between religion and being born again. Between all the other religions of being genuinely saved. And so then in the last part of this chapter, chapter 5, in closing, he says in verse 16 through 26, walk by the Spirit. Don't use your freedom for the flesh. Walk in the Holy Spirit. And then he lists the deeds of the flesh, as we've, we've looked at every week. And then he lists the fruit of the Spirit, as we're going to be looking at. So now I understand in the greater context, he's saying, we have freedom from the law, but let's use it to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not in further sin. That's why in verse 24 he says, Now to those who belong in Christ Jesus, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Verse 25, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And then listen, he says exactly what he said, Halfway through the chapter, verse 26, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. In other words, he's saying the negative, but the positive would be, let us love one another. That's what it's about. We're to love one another in the church. And then in chapter 6, is simply some very simple instructions. Again, summarizing what he said so far. Instructing them to bear one another's burdens, love one another, serve one another. He says some other things too. But it's basically bringing everything from a head into a close. In verse 14, he closes these words. I'll read the last four verses of this chapter. Or last five, excuse me. He says, But may it be, may it, excuse me, but it, 
May it never be that I will boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. That beautifully summarizes what he's saying. The Spirit gives us the ability. It's not about the law, it's not about that. It's about the Spirit enabling us to walk in holiness. Verse 16, And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. We are the true Israel of God. The church is the true Israel of God. Verse 17, From now on let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the grand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Brethren, be encouraged. Let's preach the gospel. Let's walk in the spirit. Let's love one another. Let's, let's walk in holiness because he enables us to do so. We're no longer under the law, but we have the grace by the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill it, to walk in obedience to it. Not out of the sense of, if I don't do this, I'm not going to be saved. In a sense of, because Christ has fulfilled it for me, and because I have his righteousness and his forgiveness because of his death and his resurrection... I will walk in obedience to the law for God's glory. If this is the first time you've heard the gospel of grace, and first time understanding the fact that you've trusted in yourself rather than Christ, turn and live. Look to Him and live. Trust in the fact that He died for your sin and rose again. Trust in His righteousness alone to justify you, and you will receive the spirit of grace. So in closing, we've seen chapter 1, Paul Paul defends his apostolic ministry, chapter 2. He illustrates the fact that, we are, that circumcision is nothing by using the story between him and Peter. Chapter 3, he explains the abstract reality of salvation by faith alone. Chapter 4, he talks about our sonship in Christ, the fact that we're free from the law. And chapter 5, he talks about how we don't need circumcision. We're, we're called to love one another, love God and love our neighbor. And walk in that by the Spirit who has written the law upon our hearts and our minds. Who is enabling us to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. We're not to use our freedom for the flesh, but to use it for the power of the Holy Spirit and for the glory of God. And then lastly, in chapter 6, he gives exhortations about how to walk in genuine holiness. And how to walk in truth. And brings it all to a head. By saying, let us not boast in anything else but in the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Praise God for that cross. It's not about circumcision or uncircumcision or the law. It's about grace through faith in Christ alone for the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Father, please bless us now, Lord God, as we go out into this world. May these words transform our lives, sanctify us, conform us to Christ's image. And if anyone has yet to experience these things, Father, bring them to come to pass in their lives. Lord God, we praise you, we worship you, we extol you. And we glorify you as the God of glory and grace and truth. And who has revealed these beautiful things to us in your word. We praise you for your word. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.